Hey guys, welcome back. This is Matt Chat, episode 515, featuring an interview with one Mr. Chris Baker. And now Chris is one of these guys that's been everywhere and done everything. I mean, it's kind of incredible, this guy's resume. He's had big roles at Marvel, LucasArts, Lucasfilm. He's uh, got a great YouTube channel. He's written books. <laughs> They're also great. And he's even done the writing uh, on some really cool RPGs, including Operencia and Circus Electrique. All very creative, very innovative stuff, and uh, they were kind of singled out for the great writing. So I'm really pleased to get to talk to Chris. Uh, as you'll see, lots of great stories, behind-the-scenes stuff, and just uh, interesting topics all around. Uh, anyway, we've got a lot to cover, so without further ado, here it's Mr. Chris Baker. So, Mr. Chris Baker. Yeah, that's me. Yeah, impressive. Just so many things, so many projects. I mean... <laughs> I've, I've uh, yeah, I've had a very uh, blessed career. Um, you know, sometimes more than others. Unemployed right now. That that'd be a nice thing to get out of the way. But uh, <laughs> I was gonna go. It, you know, it's Operancy game. I was playing that. Great stuff. Yeah. Cool. How far did you get? Electric. I got through about the first chapter. I think. Cool. It's harder than I was would have thought. <laughs> oh really? <laughs> I mean, I was able to get through, but it's definitely yeah. not, it's not as not an easy thing, which yeah, I like we, level of challenge. Yeah, the, the the devs behind it are very hardcore RPG people, so uh, oh, I could tell you know, they want to challenge themselves too. <laughs> yeah, it's good good stuff. Yeah, yeah. But I was wondering. I thought we could start. Let's see, so many things, Chris. Ah, <laughs> YouTube channel somewhere. <laughs> there's your right there. We go. <laughs> yeah, so. You know, for folks not familiar with your work, I mean, you've been all over the place. PlayStation yeah. Magazine, LucasArts, Marvel, you had some great Kindle books, Zen Studios, some of those games we've been talking about. Mm -hmm. uh, so I thought you'd be a good person to talk to about what you think about the state of the games industry right now. Do you think? Oh. With the economy and the uh yeah you know uh for, for people <laughs> <laughs> for people like me i mean it's kind of the story of the year and it that, that like we've had this string of great 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 games maybe arguably the, like the best year ever for for actual video games mm -hmm. and one of the worst years ever for layoffs and people losing their jobs and uh i i've uh <laughs> that happened to me very early this year i've had a couple things pop up here and there that, that you know help pay some bills but um but yeah it's 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 a it's a rough time out there to be a developer it seems like at least every week if not two three times a week you're hearing about mass layoffs somewhere and then you know you're probably there's probably tons of quiet layoffs happening you know when i was laid off it was just me mm -hmm. uh because uh you know they wanted to focus on on pinball which is totally understandable uh but um but yeah like uh uh, you know, I, I will say just personally speaking, I, I am getting a few more interviews and such than I was uh, for most of the year lately. So, um, you know, hopefully that's a good sign that things are turning around. You know, I'm not sure if that's a, a, a real indicator or if it's just like the end of the year and people want to have people starting in January <laughs> and stuff like that. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, it at, at a business level, it, it's it's kind of crappy right now for, for games. Uh, but, you know, I, I, I think it's going to come back. I, you know, I'll be honest. I don't fully understand why. Yeah, it's just like, why we're, we're so a crappy time? I mean, yeah, it's, it, you know, I, I read stuff like uh, there was this bubble during the pandemic where a lot of people were hiring and, and now that bubble is bursting. And I, I guess that's it. But, you know, I'm I'm just not an economist, I guess. <laughs> So, uh, uh, you know, I, I could only speak from uh, my, my personal experience and, and that is that it, it kind of sucks right now, but, um, you know, I, it, it is a, a cyclical thing and, uh, it will bounce back. The question is when, uh, hopefully soon for thousands of, I think there's something like 10,000 unemployed game devs right now. Um, 10, I mean, 
Yeah. I mean, just looking at your resume, you're like, really? I mean, <laughs> I would, like, I think this would be, oh, I'm, hey, here I am, you know, oh, 15 things, you know, offers, boom. Uh, it's, uh, so, I mean, I'm just yeah, thinking, like, tougher than anything. My problem, my personal you're problem. Out today, you know, we're, <laughs> what's that? I mean, if you were just starting out today, mm-hmm. I think you would be in a, it would be tougher than when you started. Uh, oh, oh, you mean as, as just a professional in general? Yeah. Uh, yes. About yes. 98 or so. I mean, I, I really, I totally fell into this industry, man. Like uh, 1998, I'm, uh, I'm between my junior and senior years of, of college in, at the university of Tennessee. And, uh, I just see like, you know, this is, we didn't have blogs yet in 1998. We had, uh, email newsletters <laughs> and I was, I had this email newsletter called, uh, Zentertainment. And uh, it was just a, a guy who would take like Hollywood Reporter and Variety and like publish all the really, you know, the stuff that geeks are into, uh, into a newsletter every week. And then eventually he had like this classified section at the end of it. And, and I saw this call for, uh, we're looking for people to review every video game ever made for allgame.com. And I was like, I was actually like, you know, kind of a lapsed gamer at that point because I was uh, focused on school. <laughs> um, but, you know, I was I was a gamer all my life. And I was like, yeah, you know, I, I could totally just whip out some Nintendo reviews, no problem. Um, so, yeah, I just sent them like, I don't know, 500 words about my gaming history. And like the next day they were like, you're hired. And so I was making I was making money writing about video games not a lot of money but it was consistent um for this site called allgame.com that died in 2014 but it was a, it was a great first step in the industry uh you know got me experience i needed to get my first real job which was the official us playstation magazine uh which in itself is a small miracle that <laughs> i was hired there i actually interviewed for both them and electronic gaming monthly at the same time uh got got opm um as you see my background here this is one of the cover stories i did was for spider-man and uh, i did that madden one down there and a hulk one there um so yeah yeah that was a that was a great time too but like it, you know that was Paradise. magazines this was a day when magazines were a thing right not not, not so much anymore there's a, a very few and the best ones are like about retro so it's like <laughs> all about that that time so um but yeah like like I was actually on a path to be in advertising like that was what I studied in college and you know it's not like I was super passionate about it but it was like Mm -hmm. uh but you know I I thought I was clever with words and whatnot and you know like advertising is a nice kind of short form thing I can I can I wanted to make the next energizer bunny that was my uh (laughs) that was my like credo in in college because i really like the energizer buddy for whatever reason i have his funko pop somewhere around here too but um <laughs> not a little doctor but you know like the mock commercials they made for those are hilarious. yeah yeah those were fun those are super fun like it was very impressionable i think they came out when i was like 12 or 13 so it was i was very impressionable to satire i guess around then i was just discovering satire like snl and all that was was huge um but yeah so uh but yeah i i kind of just fell into the industry which is not good advice for anyone who wants to get <laughs> in this tree. <tree. laughs> and it, it's probably very uncommon and you sure don't get it in through writing on a magazine, you know, even a website and you know, there's huge websites obviously, and that's a good first step, but you know, that's old. There's only so many IGNs and game spots out there. And, you know, honestly, like stuff like YouTubers and even TikTokers <laughs> and people like that are, are, you know, I they, I used to be like, oh, those that's kind of cute, but no, that's like legit now. That's like super legit. Uh, as you know, I don't have to tell you that being a YouTuber is <laughs> super legit, <laughs> but there there are people you know who who just from YouTube can can make their their living as well as I did. You know, gaming journalism has never paid well. Uh, you know, I, I was. Uh, my first layoff was actually from uh, that magazine and uh, it was a kind of a blessing in disguise because it, it kind of kicked me out the door to, okay, do other things that actually will pay you what you're worth. Uh, so, uh, so yeah, then I went to LucasArts. That's where I did PR, which is like the other side of the, the gaming journalism coin. Um, you know, they, they liked that I 
had been in journalism and they liked that I was a huge Star Wars fan. Uh, so, um, so yeah, I, I, I worked there for three years. Um, am I just, am I just reciting my resume now? Basically, is that is kind of what I, I resume? I, I can't imagine a better background for somebody who was interested in game design. I mean, somebody that's written over 400 video games. Well, I haven't, re- I've you, written about you didn't describe. <laughs> yeah. Review the, yeah, that. during that time. Sorry, uh, yeah. You reviewed, described approximately yeah. 400 video games. And of course, this was 98, 2000. So this was yeah. well before you could just easily look up anything, right? You had to actually right. find Yeah, it. that was kind of what the, the idea of that site was. It was, it was, it was a, it was a kind of a Wikipedia, really. I mean, we, I mean, Wikipedia. Such a, such a view of the breadth of the diversity of all these games. Cause yeah, yeah. Yeah. You know what I, I would do? Like back then, um, you know, if you buy an NES instruction booklet now, you're lucky if it's like eight dollars. You know, they're they're pretty expensive. But like, I I went to like this used game store, and they had like this huge bin of NES manuals, and you know they're selling for like a dollar a piece. And I was like, if I buy these in bulk, can I get them for like a quarter a piece? <laughs> and they were like, uh, yeah, sure. So I just went through the manuals and I just like described every 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 game description was like uh, I think it was like two hundred one hundred to two hundred words, not not very long. And, uh, you know, and, and I just described the game, I would get like 10 bucks every time. Uh, so it was it was a nice like uh, return on investment. Uh, back then, uh, it was a, a very unique first job in the industry. I don't think many people can say they, they just, I don't, I don't know, Brutal. stumbled upon a, a classified ad and found themselves on a path of the video game industry. I don't think of the um, name it's Leonard Moulton that wrote all the little yeah. Review. So you're kind of like the Leonard Maltin of that. That was one of the goals, like actually like a stated goal at one point was to have like this database completed and then we would start publishing books like Leonard Maltin. Like that was actually like uh, a reference point <laughs> that didn't happen. But uh, it was it, it. You know, you could still Wayback Machine at allgame.com. There's a lot of impressive yeah, well, just, there's a lot of stuff. I don't know how much of it is it impresses, but, but uh, a lot of really terrible NES games. I know for sure. So you know, <laughs> oh yeah, I, I writing a. <laughs> you know, it's it's more. I would say it's more fun to write oh, about a bad much. game than it is just a, a, a an average one. The average average games are like the the hardest to describe and and well to review because, mm-hmm. you know, how do you say? Ah, eh, it's fine. <laughs> that's that's yeah. Graphics are fine. Nothing really it's, remarkable. It's fun enough, you know. You're not going to hate yourself for playing it. Uh, yeah, <laughs> like how many different ways could you say that? You're not hate yourself for playing it. Yeah, that's yeah, a, yeah. That's a great. That's a review, I think. <laughs> Back of the box. <laughs> you have a any? Do you have a memory of like the worst ones you ever you've ever seen for that? Uh the worst games I've reviewed for all game. It was Cliffhanger on NES. Hmm. Uh, the it was like an it was like came out at the very end of the NES life cycle, like uh, 94 or something like that. Based on and the- yeah, based on the the Sylvester Stallone movie, which, you know, had an adequate game on on the 16 bit systems. But the yeah, the the NES game looked like a first generation NES game and it controlled terribly. And uh, yeah, that was it. Actually, you know, I didn't review it, but the worst NES game is the Uncanny X-Men. <laughs> I don't know if you ever played that one. Um, I have a lot of experience with the NES. It's the game that taught me that games could be bad. It's like, it was like, you know, I, I went through well into my teenage years, I would say, like thinking every game was, was good. And if if I wasn't good at it or if I didn't like it, it was because I sucked. That's kind of like, you know, kind of how I looked at video games. And then like I played the Uncanny X-Men. It was like, you know, this is just this is just awful. This is really bad. <laughs> you kind of it doesn't really come across in screenshots it actually plays kind of like gauntlet a little bit okay. if uh if like every three steps you died basically oh. and if you had an ai companion who was just incredibly dumb and died on their own in two seconds um <laughs> it's always the worst thing when you have something such a great license and never all everybody's yeah. so excited about it but then the game was just crap. wolverine kicks <laughs> it's it's like what, what what's going on here uh it even had like t- to get the true like last level you had to enter a secret code 
that they printed in tiny, tiny text on the cover of the game cartridge. If you didn't know that, you would never see the, see the game in its entirety, even if you were like, you know, <laughs> so, so just uh, masochistic, I guess, enough to, to uh, make your way through that. Is that like some um, kind of copy protection, or were they worried about people having a pirated copy? Mm, I don't know. I I, I don't know. We, uh, the thing about that game is like no one even knows the true developer of it. Like people think <laughs> it might have been uh, early days of Atlas. I think I heard, mm. uh, but and no one really sure. <laughs> Funny how some of the worst games will. It's like they want to go yeah. so far with the copy protection on these games that nobody would ever care about. Anything. I also love that the uh, on that game, the, the box art says the Uncanny X-Men, the side of the box says X-Men, and the title screen says Marvel's X-Men. So it's like got three different titles. <laughs> Just pick, pick whichever one you like. I'm a, I'll take I usually it. default to the, the box cover. That's typically my... Uh... Oh, boy. Yeah. <laughs> interactive that's clever right you know <laughs> with the e yes. it's an I. oh the, the good thing about that game it, it as far as i can tell it invented the comic book uh, character bio in video games so that that that's just one redeeming feature <laughs> uh, this is oh there's the cartridge yeah yeah if you look at the like uh just no. below the seal of quality to the right like just below yeah just below made in japan to the right you'll see uh yeah it says b plus up together with start that's that'll get you <laughs> the last level of the game but yeah who's gonna read that no wow yeah and it wasn't like a super popular game that you know everyone knew it because it was in nintendo power or something so you, you, I, I didn't know about that until like a, a I think some YouTube video pointed out a few years ago, just very recently. Uh, yeah, it's it's a it's a it's a bad game, but uh, <laughs> there are good X Men games too. Yeah, there, there's good Marvel games, obviously. Um, yeah, and we talked about the worst. We probably should mention some of the best. <laughs> of course, you got uh, PlayStation reviews as well, hundreds. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. The, I did a couple hundred PlayStation reviews. Did I, oh, I reviewed Spider-Man NES, or not NES, PlayStation 1. That, that was a, a great game. Uh, you know, the Spider-Man uh, PS2 games were really good, too. Uh, the, the movie games. Uh, what else? I like the Hulk. I like the, the Hulk movie game. Um, even the, the, the pre, everyone goes to Ultimate Destruction, but the one before that I thought was, was just a fun beat-em-up. Um, so yeah, there were some, some decent Marvel games. Uh, the the Wolverine one was okay, but I got to meet Mark Hamill out of that. That was cool. Oh, you got an interview with him on your yeah yeah. It's on my uh, on my YouTube channel, uh, superhero VG gets you to my YouTube channel where I kind of have just a, a bunch of uh, stuff about mostly superhero video games, a little bit of Star Wars, a little bit of Jurassic Park. Uh, it's uh, just a kind of a, a hobby I picked up uh, like 2017 or so when the the hype for uh, the first spider-man game uh from uh, insomniac was at its peak i was like you know i oh, spent seven Spider years at, at marvel uh i can <laughs> what's that i just saw the, yeah you got one about spider ham i haven't oh seen yeah it. yeah 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 that one Our uh comics from back in the day that one a friend of mine who's a producer at activision uh they they needed a voice for a spider ham cameo in spider-man shattered dimensions and it's just like two lines and uh so like as the associate producer he just like stepped in and and it was like how does this sound uh and he did that and it was like and the voice guy was like oh that's great just do that and so he, the associate producer of uh of uh shattered dimensions is the first ever person to voice spider ham um so i, I did a whole video he's a friend of mine it's just a, a fun fun interview with him and you know the like people like fans had had assumed it was like the voice of sonic i think it was the very because uh because he uh he sounds like uh, sonic and sonic adventure he, he kind of sounds like that so i mean i get it but uh yeah it wasn't that guy it wasn't anybody you've heard of it was uh kevin umbricht <laughs> associate <laughs> producer at activision 
Yeah, I really enjoyed your YouTube videos. There's a lot. Oh, thank you. I watched the one about Batman where you talked about how you were inspired. And sort of your there's a lot of autobiographical stuff in the video. Is is that true for all your videos? Or um, not not really. Uh, sometimes I'll just throw in a, an opinion here and there, but but it's I typically do videos about stuff that one I haven't seen other people do. You know, two is maybe a little super obscure. It just amuses me, you know, like uh, like I have one about the you've never heard of the worst Star Wars games ever made. And you probably haven't. <laughs> super bomb, super bad racing must be. Oh, no, not even close. Not, not even, even close. Not even close. <laughs> not even close. Uh, <laughs> okay. No. The, the, so. Uh, so, yeah, spoiler for that video. But you can learn all about these games. There were there were four. Ewoks and Droids games released in 1987 for the MSX system only in Spain. <laughs> and they are so bad. <laughs> um, yeah, you're, you're showing off my uh, collection of Star Wars games there. I, I do. <laughs> wait, 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 wait. Oh, yeah. Jar Jar's Journey. That's a real game. <laughs> Jar Jar's Journey. They thought that was worthy of a game. It's an edutainment title. It's actually oh. pretty decent as an edutain as oh, an edutainment title. So that's not even close to the worst. Uh, yeah. So uh, yeah, these Ewox and Droids games. There were two, two for each. Oh, that arcade version that was awesome. That arcade game. Um. Oh yeah, that that was actually not the arcade. That was based on the arcade game. You're talking about a game called Attack on the Death Star, which is a Japan exclusive. That is also incredibly obscure, but pretty cool. Actually, it's like got um, it's got a lot of uh, voices and stuff in it in 1990. Oh, um, yeah. Wow. And it, they more or less remade the Atari arcade game. But with, uh, you know, showing off everything that that uh, sharp computer, it's got X2800 or some some weird. 3000 I don't know some yeah, some number with x <laughs> is yeah. what that sharp computer is called but yeah the the Ewoks and Droids games were like one was like a memory type game and one was like a sh each had their own memory game and each had their own like uh shooter like scroll upward scrolling shooter uh and they were terrible they're just really bad <laughs> like well you've got a lot of experience with this from the other like from the licensing and deciding huh? what what should go forward and what's the crappy idea so what why do you why do you think that is that these probably not so much anymore but i remember when i was a kid there was this idea that any game based on a movie or a comic or anything is going to necessarily be terrible yeah <laughs> you know, what was that yeah that was maybe it started with et and uh... i think it did i think that basic idea started with et i think it's it was true to some extent but you know you also got good games They're like a lot of the old batman games are great like you know batman nes and uh are you like batman returns uh for super nintendo um you know the, you, you couldn't really just say the game's gonna suck because it's based on a license but uh, a lot of times it was because you know a company like ljn would just see the license and try to make the cheapest game possible and you know push out back to the future or the uncanny x-men <laughs> and uh they, they had to spend so much money to get the license that there wasn't enough left over to actually make it. uh or uh, that can be that factors into it for sure but uh you know if you're talking like way back i think they literally just leaned on the license and were like you know people know this license and the game functions uh the kids will be fine with it and i think a lot of them were you know i, I think uh you know, like I said, it took me a, a long time to figure out that video games could be bad. Like <laughs> there were certainly games I preferred to play over others, but the ones I, I didn't enjoy playing, I, I just, you know, I didn't I never thought they were bad. I thought maybe something was wrong with me or, you know, it just didn't appeal to me as much. Something like that. Uh, but yeah, you know, I, I think I think actually somewhere around. I think 2014 is where I really started to notice this that the licensed games really since about that time are are good like, like almost always good like uh you know like, i think arkham asylum probably got the train rolling on that in 09 i think that was 
Uh, and, you know, then by like 2014, you've got like uh, Shadow of Mordor, like Lord of the Rings game that, you know, there hadn't really been much of anything. To, I mean, the, 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 the movie games were fun and the, you know, there, there was like a good yeah. RTS and stuff. But yeah, I, I don't think anyone was counting on, um, you know, Shadow of Mordor to be a, a lot of people's game of the year that year. And it was, it was mine. And, uh, you know, like then you start getting like Injustice, which is awesome fighting game. Uh, you know, and, and, and then eventually Spider-Man and, and, uh, you know, so I, I think more times than not, we're actually getting good licensed games now, you know, the avatar game that just came out, I, I hear really good things about, I'm not a big avatar person, but you know, I, I, I can see that it make a great game. Uh, and they're not like rushing to tie it to a movie or anything that, that kind of died, uh, like 10 years ago. Um, I worked on one of the last games that did that, and it it, it show it, it was also one of the last bad license games, uh, the Amazing Spider-Man Two. Uh, there's a whole story that I can never tell about how that, <laughs> stuff that happened behind the scenes on that one, but um, uh, yeah, it's uh, it's it's encouraging to me that like that that has totally shifted. Like I think. You know, uh, you know, you'll get the stuff that's OK, like, you know, Avengers or. Uh, I don't know, um, mine's a bit blank now, but, you know, like, like but mostly, like, you know, the Star Wars games are pretty good now. You know, if you take out the whole microtransactions travesty of Battlefront 2 a few years ago. <laughs> you know? I'll never forget how great Knights of the Old Republic was. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, Star Wars games have mostly been uh Oh, it's such a good decent. Game. Mostly, you know, there's certainly some duds in the Star Wars uh, life, <laughs> you know, the, the history of Star Wars games. But uh, I think there's been more good than bad, or at least, you know, in the spirit of Star Wars, I choose to see the good more than the bad. <laughs> um, I always like to think, with, is this a game you would like to play even if it didn't have the license? Even yeah, the past yeah. Time? I also think the other way around. I think like, you know, I'll play like I remember I played uh what was it? Zelda Twilight Princess. Right. The the, the Wii game, the the first mm -hmm. Wii launch game. And I was like, you know, I'm having a lot of fun with this. Uh but you know, what if what if Link were He-Man? What if uh Epona were Battle Cat? What if Princess Zelda was uh the sorceress or maybe Tila or kind of a combination of the two? Like would this 9.0 in in uh, EGM be still be a 9.0 because it's He Man? It's a good question. Or uh, you know, if it were the exact same design, you know, uh, Midna was basically Orko. Like I was like, you know, all the there's like all these <laughs> masters of the universe equivalencies that I'm seeing here. Um, and you know, but and I really think it wouldn't have. I think it would have been a a seven. You know. Mm -hmm. it, I think there back then, especially there was that stigma against licensed games that I, and, you know, as a reviewer, you, you know, you, you, you try to be unbiased, but there is bias. Uh, and franchises of all time, right? I mean, you, there's a certain veneration. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah, totally. Yeah. You know, like a, a Zelda game rarely gets anything less than a nine. Um, and then, you know, even that game specifically, like a lot of people look back and be, yeah, it's not one of the greatest Zeldas. You know, they probably wouldn't give it a nine today. Um, but uh, but, you know, when when a new Zelda comes out, you're super excited for it and, and you rate it highly, <laughs> it seems. I never reviewed a Zelda game because I was on a PlayStation magazine. We hear a lot about the hype machine around these big, big, long, sure. especially a title like that. And the, even sometimes the ethics of it and. How much yeah, I feel like and... there's a lot of uh, I think people really Honest. want there to be a lot of uh, ethics problems when there really aren't. I mean, occasionally something will happen, but, you know, like that plagiarism thing that IGN a couple of years ago or, or, you know, like stuff like that happens every so often. But for the most part, it's just people like gamers like you and me playing the games and sticking a score on them. And, you know, then the. The internet as it is these days uh will retaliate if they don't like it for some reason <laughs> yeah. uh, that's something i guess back we didn't have to deal with the was it what they call it review bombing yeah you know that yeah 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 i didn't really have to deal with that 
the, the closest time, actually that you want to read a game review you had to like you say you had to buy a magazine yeah and that's where you read the game reviews you, there was no uh yeah i didn't really deal i didn't I, you know we had the internet obviously when i was at the magazine but uh that th- we didn't have social media yet other than friendster <laughs> and uh, <laughs> no one's complaining on friendster uh but you know we did have like our forums um on gamers.com as it was back then and uh i do remember once somebody there there was like a a whole post about my star wars bounty hunter review a three out of five and you know it just came out that was like the day it came out and no one had played it yet and people were angry about my three out of five for for bounty hunter which you know I, i you know i'm a huge star wars fan it let me down a little bit but it was still decent enough that's a three out of five uh but yeah i remember like one guy actually was like this guy's clearly a star trek fan <laughs> <laughs> like um, what if i were really like does that and no i mean i mean i like star trek i like it fine but i'm i'm definitely star wars side of, of that equation of, you know like if that's a competition which i've always found dumb anyway uh, <laughs> Yeah, something but yeah like- I, I i was i was in a pre pre rage world i mean there was there was stuff like you know like there's stuff like uh people not liking the wind waker look for link like that was like a big internet topic in the early 2000s right um I remember that. yeah yeah like, you know, stuff like that would come along but it wasn't really ever directed at a bad review or something actually my friend greg greg seward of egm he was the 9.5 out of 10 to against two other 10s at EGM for uh, Chrono Cross. And he did get a lot of hate mail for that because it would have gotten a platinum if he had only you know, given it a 10. And uh, it's so important. It's so important that a, a, a game like Chrono Cross is, is, gets that platinum. But yeah, he, he got like hate mail. Like, I, I, like a couple, like, I'm going to kill you for this. Like, like, like Hammer, really... Sir. Just regular for, cameras were sending in this sort of criticism of the review. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was. <laughs> he still gets crap for it today. It's like his legacy at EGM was being the nine point five on Chrono Cross. <laughs> yeah, there's so much going on with Star Wars and Marvel lately. You know, with, I think it's. I wouldn't want to be in that. <laughs> you know, world. Oh right, yeah, like just uh, crazy stuff. Yeah. Here. From yeah, fans. all the people complaining what the, about the, what the heck wokeism or whatever. Yeah, <laughs> what's up with these fans? You know, are you, are you a fan or not? I mean, how can you just hate everything about your thing? You're used. I mean, to? some people see their fandom as like, you know, like finding something to complain about, and that's how they prove that they're a fan. I don't know. I I <laughs> wait. Well, let me. I'm processing this. So the, the way. Yeah. They're a fan is by complaining. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, that's just observation there. Like, uh, you know, I, I will say like, I, I see what you're saying. I just don't understand. Yeah, I, I'm not, I'm by no means sticking up for this mentality, but mm-hmm. I do understand that if you are particularly passionate about something that you're extra critical of it too. Like, uh, you know, like whenever I play, you know, I just played Spider-Man too. And, you know, I, I, I have criticisms of that game, even though I think it's brilliant. I, I definitely have criticisms of that game that, uh, you know, I'm not hearing other people say, uh, you know, like some story issues and stuff like that. But, um, you know, I, I think it's because, you know, it is my fan of Spider-Man and being a fan of Spider-Man games and having worked on Spider-Man games myself. Uh, you know, like I'm extra. It's hard to just be a fan of, of things anymore. <laughs> you know? it's, that's the curse. The blessing and the curse of of being in the entertainment industry is like you just never you never consume entertainment again like like you used to when you were you know not in it it's uh there's always some degree of uh i'm working here mentality Uh, you know there's always some degree of uh oh i see where they're cutting a corner right there where you know where it kind of takes you out of it a little bit (laughs) and just enjoy it as a consumer anymore yeah yeah you know i'm not saying you can't enjoy things you can definitely enjoy things it's just uh, there is it it is it is a little more complicated i guess you could say yeah i learned early on in my 
career as a professor that you never want to show students your favorite movie. Oh, really? Interesting. <laughs> once you do that, you'll never enjoy it again. <laughs> <laughs> you know, once it, like once it goes from just something that's entertainment to something you're, you know, criticizing or you know, once you make it becomes 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 part of your job, right? <laughs> sure, sure. Something about being paid to work on it somehow takes away the. So you're saying you showed students your favorite movie and they uh, picked it so apart and you. Reason. Well, for one, yeah, no, usually they didn't like it nearly as much as I did. Okay. Fair <laughs> enough. Complain about it. And, you know, it's just, uh, I, I find it much better to find movies that they really like. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. It's like, you know, my daughter is, is three and, uh, and, uh, you know, I want to show her the Grinch, like the classic Grinch cartoon that, sure. that, you know, I grew up with. And, you know, we started watching once and she was kind into it, but she had already seen the the 3D movie from Illumination that came out a few years ago. And she was like, I want the real Grinch. <laughs> I want the real, like, no, what? No, this, this is the good yeah. one. This is the good one. You should be watching that. I was wondering what it would be like to be a kid these days and, and watch uh, the original, well, Star Wars, whatever. the new Yeah. <laughs> like for me, and I think for you too, that was like this life changing. Sure. <laughs> Yeah, totally. Thing. Absolutely. I don't know. Like, what would their experience be? Was, well, that's that's an okay movie. Or... I think it's I think yeah. it's like kind of a homogenized like, you know, this is the thing with lightsabers and and the force and and you know spaceships and robots and and stuff like that. I don't I don't think they think of it in terms of like, you know, the Skywalker saga or whatever. Like, I am your father. Like they they probably just know I am your father through being alive and uh you know like it because there's just so much stuff it's like you know think of, think of it in like you know Deep maybe in. like dc comics when you were when you were a kid with dc comics it's not like you knew the whole chronology of batman right it, you knew you knew who bruce wayne was and you knew he was at stately wayne manor and you like know in your video you pointed you were talking about i think batman and you're like yeah mm -hmm. one of the best some of the best comics were the ones that like gave you the backstories and like the oh yeah 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 uh, yeah i love this called but yeah i would always get those too i'm like oh man <laughs> so much yeah dc calls them the who's who marvel calls it the official handbook but uh yeah it's just a, a in-depth bio um but in the pre-wikipedia days um yeah like uh like you know my daughter like uh the way she sees star wars is uh you know she's been growing up with with the mandalorian being popular and of course grogu is like front and center there and she'll like she like Grogu is like the number one character for her. She doesn't even watch Star Wars, but she knows stuff around it. But, uh, you know, she'll see Yoda and she'll she used to call him Daddy Grogu <laughs> or just Grogu. Uh, so it was, it was always funny to me because the, we first identified uh, Grogu as, as baby Yoda. Right. But to her, uh, Yoda is old Grogu. You know, it's like uh, it's just kind of a, a different mentality there. It, it amuses me. I wonder, if yeah, they, how popular Grogu was going to be when they <laughs> rolled that show out. Because well, apparently they like Favreau was like, wow. you were not making, you were not making any uh, merchandising stuff uh, yet because we don't want spoilers. So they must have known something, uh, but they probably also lost out on a lot of money uh, not having <laughs> stuff on shelves <laughs> right, right when it was revealed. Well, but I think they've done okay since then. Yeah, so when you were at LucasArts from 2005 to 2007, studio mm -hmm. publicist. Yeah, I was I was in PR at LucasArts. Uh, uh, game, first game I did there was... Uh, when I, when I, first game I represented there, I did a game is, is a, overstating things when you're in PR. First game I represented there was uh, episode three, uh, the, the movie game. Uh, but then... Battlefront 2, the first Battlefront 2. What does that mean to represent were you? Oh, you know, like uh, I'm, uh, well, uh, publicizing, you know, just, uh, be, you know, if, if someone wants information on this, they come to me, that sort of thing, that, that, in terms of, of you know, uh, publicizing uh, and uh, uh, promoting is another good word, synonym. Uh, <laughs> 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 yeah so yeah battlefront 2 lego star wars 2 uh and like the early days of uh the force unleashed uh pr were were like the big ones for me uh, in my era there 
I mean, was that um, a fun job or did it feel like, did you feel like a burden of responsibility? Both, both. Yeah. I mean, it's Star Wars. So of course you, you yeah, feel, I mean, uh, <laughs> but, but it also was Star Wars. So I, I knew it, yeah. <laughs> you know, and it was like, all right, I can, I can write a fun press release with a bunch of references that fans will get. And, uh, you know, m not, not many people can actually do that. Uh, I really had a lot of fun writing the Lego Star Wars 2 press release and announced the game because it was like it was both it was both Star Wars references and Lego references. So I think I, you know, I had like lines of, about repairing a galaxy in pieces or something like that, you know, like just fun little puns <laughs> and such. Uh, and, you know, at LucasArts, like one of the cool fun things I did was, uh, you know, there were many and um, that yeah like well, one of the things I, that i really loved doing was i put together this uh exhibit basically for star wars celebration in 2007 mm -hmm. which was the 25th anniversary of star wars games because we didn't really have much we, we needed to be there but it was like too early for uh the force unleashed to really show anything other than just that it's coming out in like a promo video um, and there wasn't anything, you know, Lego Star Wars 2 had just come out, Empire War had just come out. There, there wasn't really anything super hot. Mm -hmm. So we were like, what are we going to do with this booth that we need? And I was like, you know, we can celebrate the history of Star Wars video games. So, uh, so I, I put together this uh, exhibit, um, we made it onto Spike TV. Like Jeff Keighley actually was there, like, uh, uh, talking to one of our, uh, marketing people about it. Um, and it had like, I think there was like two missing and, and, uh, I guess those, uh, those Spain ones were missing too. Cause I didn't know they existed at the time, but, uh, but yeah, it was, it was just a, a fun, cool thing. The fans really, really, really appreciated. Like, you know, we did a little video that went next to it. That was like just five seconds of every game. And, um, and then people would just stare and be like, oh, I remember that. Or what, that was a game, you know, like <laughs> that's always, uh, fun. Um. I got to do a little uh, like trivia show kind mm -hmm. of. They, they called it uh, Shake the Bake because, uh, you know, Chris Baker is my last name. Uh, and, and you know, and I'm like the the guy who knows. I, I knew a, a little bit about Star Wars games I hadn't played and stuff like that. So I was like, uh, can you guys stump me with uh, your trivia questions about Star Wars games? And, you know, if you do, you get a prize. Uh, so, you know, people in the, in the crowd would like just ask me about like, Knights of the Old Republic and Battlefront, and you know, <laughs> uh, they got me a couple times. But uh, what do they get you? Have, I don't remember. It's been because <laughs> you've heavily been a long time, <laughs> sixteen years. <laughs> so much to study. I do remember there was one kid who was oh, like, movies. so, 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 if you're playing Battlefront and you want to recruit uh, an Imperial officer, and you also want to recruit this uh, bla certain blaster, how many credits will that cost? Oh, yeah. Uh, oh, okay. I guess you win, but that's not a fair question. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Ask me what the blaster was called. Ask me what, uh, you know, that class of soldier was called. That's a more fair question than like math. <laughs> but, Darn. Yeah. For some reason, super bomb bad racing comes up all the time amongst my. <laughs> it's quirky. It's it's just a, a quirky. Game. We're always joking about how it's the best Star Wars game ever made, if not the best game. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's just kind of a little inside joke, I guess. Yeah, yeah. you know, uh, bomb bad means both good and bad in, in Gungan, by the way. Oh. If you didn't. <laughs> so... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Get to pose that as a trivia question. I've... I, I'm pretty sure that's what it. Yeah, I did the research once. I, I'm pretty sure it means, uh, you know, it, it's like a total like smurfing. You know, use the word smurf as a smurf. It can mean anything. <laughs> For whatever reason, just the other day, I looked into that. I watched the the first Smurfs cartoon. <laughs> I want to see if I can get your book up here. Yeah, here we go. Because we're kind of touching on some of this stuff, right? Sure. Yeah, there we go. X-Wings, lightsabers, and Scorpion Vader. Celebrating, Celebrating 40 years of Star Wars video games. Yeah, that's... Uh, cool, cool. Yeah, I'm glad. That this, this is how you found me, right? As I recall, like, I was promoting this, and yeah, and you guys came to me. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm very flattered, first of all, that you picked it up, because uh, 
Yeah, it's pretty niche at the end of the day. <laughs> um, I, you know, it's very succinct. So, you know, it's not one of those, you never feel like, oh, <laughs> hit with a Yeah. Wall. I, I, you know, I, I enjoy fun, game. You read this, you, you get kind of, your passion for it comes through really well. Yeah, I enjoy like, you know, reading about game history and stuff as much as anybody. But, you know, the, I, I also like, I, you know, I'm a magazine guy. I, I like uh, I like stuff that's pretty short and, and nuggety, as we used to say back then, with, you know, a lot of pictures. He made uh, so, in here that was so good in this. I forget where it was. Maybe an intro somewhere. And you're like, well, I could have done, you know, if I'd done what people had expected, it would basically be just a Wikipedia. Yeah. <laughs> rehab. Yeah. No, I, I felt that uh, criticism as well with some of my books, but you know, I think this is the right approach where you focus more on like, let's see, how did you phrase this? Sort of your experience with them and your memories, and yeah, here's where you talked about the vision. Yeah, uh, so, yeah, well, you might have to remind me exactly what you wrote, but yeah, not you didn't want to regurgitate material oh i did I, I mean i did recursion a lot of this book is actually stuff that i published uh when i, I did some freelancing in 17 yeah 2017 oh, and yeah. and uh and yeah it was uh i did the the top 40 moments of in star wars video games uh this was for uh, glixel.com which is uh or not is was Rolling Stones uh, video game portion for a while. And, and, you know, they they did a lot of just like features like that was their thing. Uh, so, yeah, I did a couple stories for them, you know, really long. This, like this is 8000 words, I think. the And it's even longer now because I added stuff to it. Uh, it's probably closer to 9000 for that section. And, uh, you know, it's it's the top 40. It's actually more like 45, 46. <laughs> uh, of the, the moments like just moments not not the games but like yeah, moments yeah, from games trying, that's what i was trying to remember so this is like the moments yeah yeah it, it's because you know there's tons of like best star wars games list and you know that that's interesting but also boring to me because you know no <laughs> one's really played all of these games end to end you know you can't make a game a list like that without like going off of what other people are saying so this is my list based mostly on just my own experience with these games. Maybe a little bit of the, the you know, external world seeping in there. But um, yeah, yeah, it was just a, a lot. I thought it was a fun way to basically look at the history of Star Wars games without just being a history of Star Wars games. Sadly, not uh, even Star Wars Legends Lord tried to account for a Vader that turned into a shark. <laughs> yeah, the, the title of the game, for those who don't, or movie. No, no, no. The title of the book. It's not a game. It's not a movie. It's a book, uh, which is just on Kindle right now, by the way. Uh, I'd love to get it in a paperback or something, but I don't know if that's possible. Um, that's something I've been looking into that just publishing on a Kindle. Because this is like such a good way to go these days, right? So I'm trying to go through. Yeah, that. especially if it's just words. The The hard thing about this book is just formatting with all the pictures that I have, all the images. Yeah, I don't even was it did you submit this like a PDF or how do they uh this I did I you can I don't remember if I submitted it as a PDF or a EPUB or or what the format was but um yeah you have to you know because there's a billion types of ways it'll show up on people's devices right because because when I say it's for Kindle it's not just for actual Kindle devices it's for the Kindle app on your iPhone and your Android and you know oh, yeah. It, yeah, like the, the Kindle app on your tiny iPhone 5 is going to, which some people may still have, I don't know, is like going to come up a lot differently than, you know, on your your new huge iPhone, uh, and which, which will look different than an iPad, which will look different than a, an actual Kindle device. So like, uh, you know, it, it's tough to make it look good. Uh, that's one of the big challenges of, of publishing on Kindle. But, you know, if it is just words, um, which, you know, a lot of people do, and, and that's that's great. You know, most books are just words, uh, th then uh, then it's much easier. It, you can just, yeah, it is just a PDF or a Word file or something like that. And, um, you yeah, know, you can... I think of just about anything I would want to put on there would have to have lots of screenshots. So 
<laughs> That's a pain, sounds like. It, it is, but, you know, maybe I'm overstating it too, but, uh, you know, because it does, the devices do do a pretty good uh, job of just uh, correcting themselves, I guess, like, uh, you know, formatting them, themselves within the formatting that you give it. But sometimes it'll look really, really bad. Like, you can... You know, I like uh, a lot of the images I have in there. I have like two screenshots and I'm I I made one image file out of those two screenshots just so that it wouldn't like stack on top of each other and like just look bad. And that took a lot of that was a lot of work. Like, you know, it, it's uh, just doing the uh, design graphic design you Call it if it were an actual book. <laughs> like that, that probably took as much time as actually writing the stuff. You know, I work with a lot of students that are interested in writing careers, and I've been always talking about, well, maybe you should look into this Kindle, mm -hmm. publishing something on a Kindle. And then the, the, usually some the more clever ones <laughs> will say, well, yeah, but what about marketing? Because you know, the publishers, <laughs> a traditional publisher would be able to market yeah. and all this kind of work. But you're you're kind of, you know about that. <laughs> I mean, it's I tough. Know. I mean, I, I didn't have any budget for this. So I, I relied on social media and like, just telling all my friends to retweet it, basically. <laughs> and, uh, and that that turned out to be like the announcement of the book would turn out to be like, probably my biggest tweet ever. Um, and, but you know, the, the sales are still kind of moderate. It's not like I'm making bank here. It's like, uh, I was, but, but, I was wondering how you're doing like, not, so it doesn't sound like bad. Yeah, I mean, it, it. I, you know, I in no way did I make minimum wage putting this book together. <laughs> it was, it was definitely a passion project. Okay. Uh, but you know, it, it's it's nice. It's just a nice thing to have out there in the world. And you know, like these articles that I had done for Glixel are, are totally gone from the internet, basically. So uh, I own them, and I was like, I might as well just put them out there. And then, um, you know, I added to that. Um, uh, the history of Hoth, which was another just fun way to look at the history of games without being just straight up the history of games. And there's over there's over 50 battles of Hoth in Star Wars games. It's it's pretty crazy. Uh, yeah, and that that was actually a project I started for my YouTube channel, and you can see part one of it on my YouTube channel. And I just never got around to finishing it. Uh, on my YouTube channel, it's got like every Hoth battle through the 90s. Uh, so that that's a fun video to watch. It's not obviously if you think of it in that term, it, it is complete. But, um, you know, I finished that uh, as part of this, which Dell, you know, got me into looking at mobile games and stuff I didn't even know existed. Every battle, well, yeah, it's one of those parts that just lends itself so well to a game. Oh, yeah, yeah. And, um, you know, it's just such a classic battle and it's... Uh, yeah, it, it, it is. I, I mean, think that kid watching that was this 82 in this game. Yeah, 80, 80. 80 yeah, mm -hmm. I, can't watch, I remember watching this as a kid in the theater and being like, man, I just wish I was in one of those. Oh. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like all these and uh, the, the game that came out in 82, the game came out in 82. I even, uh, had, I even had this little ship as a toy, but I can't think of the name of it. The snow speeder. The little, uh, is that what it's called? The snow, yeah, it's just a snow speeder. No speeder. OK. Yeah. I think there's a there's a technical name for it, but oh, most wow. people just call it the snow speeder. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's what yeah. sounded like that was fun. Oh, to to put that list together? Yeah, it was, it was it was fun. It was a lot more work than I thought it'd be, especially for the the latter half of it, because I just I wasn't familiar with a lot of these like mobile games and stuff. Uh and you know, and like the old Republic has a Hoth level. It's it's you know, it's not the Battle of Hoth, but it is uh it's a huge section of the old Republic MMO is on Hoth and I don't play that. So I had to just watch YouTube videos of people playing it a couple different ways, uh, just so I could get a decent summary in there, you know, and some screenshots. Uh, yeah, like, uh, but there's some really interesting things they've done with that the battle. Of Hoth. I really like what the force unleashed did with it, where, uh, it took like the, there, there was a, a non-canon ending of the force unleashed where you killed vader and became uh the emperor's apprentice uh and so you're leading the battle path instead of vader and basically go in there and, and convert luke to the dark side ultimately <laughs> it's pretty awesome 
I want to show you your other book here too, if I can. Sure. This is a lot of fun. <laughs> Wrong. Retro games. You messed up our comic book heroes, which, uh, yeah, it was just a, I, I was just experimenting with uh, the idea of doing a Kindle book back then. And, and I wanted to put, pump something out nice and quick. And it still wasn't nearly as quick as I was initially <laughs> anticipating it to be. But, you know, it was, the basic uh, idea of the book is that, um, you know, I learned a lot about superheroes in my early days through playing video games. And back then, especially, you know, staying on brand wasn't really that important. So I went through like every game from uh, beginning with Superman on 2600, the first superhero game uh, through uh, what, 92, I think X-Men is the last thing, X-Men Arcade. And I, I find something that just got that they just got were wrong about <laughs> in adapting really fun book. That's... It's that's all it's meant to be. It's just like a, uh, it's like a really super long Buzzfeed article. I've seen it described as, and I can't really deny that. Uh, but yeah, it was, uh, I, I do think, you know, it's, again, it's just a, a fun way to look back at the history of something without just being a straight history. Cause do you really care what you did in gameplay for Howard the duck? <laughs> or do you just want to hear something funny about it? <laughs> I just want to hear something fun. Yeah. <laughs> I, I love the trivia, by the way, that uh, the first, you know, because Activision was known for Marvel games for a long time, right? Uh, and if you ask somebody what the first Activision Marvel game was, a lot of them will say Spider-Man, which is wrong. Uh, a lot of more right is X-Men Mutant Academy, which was a few months before Spider-Man. But the actual first Activision game with Marvel that they did was uh, Howard the Duck when the movie came out, <laughs> like a little after the movie. Howard the Duck Adventure on Volcano Island, which is like a sequel to the movie. <laughs> ah, this is yeah, Activision. The rest really was... bad. It's like 10 minutes long. You can watch it on YouTube. Howard the Duck. Yeah, I've never understood like what in the hell is happening. <laughs> it's just a joke character. I've read some comics. They're, they're pretty fun. I've read, I've uh, seen documentaries where they talk about this was the first time that people realized that George Lucas was fallible. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's just. Yeah. I didn't even realize it was a Marvel character for years. I, I knew it was a movie. And uh, then I saw it like Howard the Duck number one and with Spider Man on the cover. And I was like, well, what? <laughs> this is from 1978. What? <laughs> I never got the, never got it, man. I might feel differently now. But as a kid, I was just perplexed, to say the least. Well, listen, I wanted to talk a little bit about your uh, what it was like at Marvel, yeah. and you proving and rejecting uh -huh. related content. I'd love to hear more about that, like what your what your criteria were. And... Sure, I mean, you know, a lot of it depended on uh, on the game. I guess I should maybe explain more what the job was. It was uh, manager of licensed games. I got I had different titles. I think uh, creative manager is what I like calling myself now. Slash story editor. Um. And basically any, I don't know if it's like this is every licensor, but at Marvel, it probably is at most. Like anything that goes into a game that's a Marvel game has to be approved. You know, if it, if it uh, like every asset, every piece of concept art, every, you know, the concept of the game itself, the script, just story treatments, they all need to be approved at some point. And so what is the fear? Is it more of a fear thing? Or is it more of a? You, know, you just need, uh, you know, stewards of the brand, as we, we would call ourselves, because uh, because not everybody knows the brand that well. Or sometimes people want to take things in directions that on a shoddy product, basically. Yeah. Or just. Uh, or just. I think, uh, you know, the purpose of the job was more so to make sure that the characters were in character, okay. you know, their costumes looked right. Uh, you know, if, if you were deviating from that in any way, that there's a good reason for it. Because, uh, you know, you can make a, like a, just a really ugly Spider-Man, and if no one's there to stop it, like this really ugly Spider-Man goes into the world, is there a reason for him to be really ugly? If there is, you know, sell us on it, and maybe we'll put him in there, like really ugly Spider-Man. Uh, but yeah, you know, depending on what the product was, uh, you know, I did movie games, I did comic games, you know, you want to be in line with that. So, uh, you know, I did uh, X-Men Origins Wolverine, which 
a lot of people say as a game was better than the movie and I don't disagree. <laughs> uh, but yeah, like, uh, you know, they'd send us their, their Hugh Jackman model and I would look it over and be like, okay, this looks pretty good, but uh, I still need Fox to sign off on it. I still need Hugh Jackman's people to sign off on it. Uh, so, so yeah, we have a whole approval process uh, sometimes with added layers like that. Um, and yeah, I mean, that's, you asked earlier, like why licensed games got that reputation. Like there is a lot of gatekeeping, uh, in terms of like, you know, making sure that everything is, is, is good and, and, or up to the brand, uh, specifications. Mm. And if it's not, you know, it can, it can throw a wrench into a production schedule and, uh, you know, that maybe they weren't anticipating or. You know, the, the, the public, when I say they, the publisher, uh, and, you know, that can mess things up and they have to make other accommodations, um, which, you know, is not ideal. And I, I don't think anybody really understands that process until they've gone through it. Um, so I think that speaks to your other earlier question as well. Uh, but, but yeah, so, you know, we... Patterns that you've seen? Uh, you know, you know, I imagine that there's kind of a tension between, well, we want to be consistent, you know, with the brand. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, we want to do some creative, wacky stuff that's never been done before. Sure. With the characters. So there must be like a. Yeah. Um, you know, like you get into stuff where, uh, you know, does it does it fit the game like uh, Marvel versus Capcom three? You know, realistically, if you fight the Hulk, you're down in one punch. Right. But that's not fun. So, you know, you, you make uh, you make gameplay concessions stuff like that even like a spider-man game spider-man punches one one like normal person he doesn't need to go whoo web up in the air slam to the ground you know like <laughs> that's really video gamey stuff that's like super, definitely overkill i mean even if you look at a spider-man comic he doesn't really even throw that many punches occasionally here and there usually just like web somebody up and leaves them for the cops right it's not like <laughs> It, you know, uh, it, it's fun to play with these characters in, in games, but uh, th there are a lot of th there's a lot of like, uh, I don't know, what's the word extensions of, of what they would, would actually do uh, just for the sake of the medium, which, you know, you always have to think of first because it, it's it's a video game. And it has to be fun. Um, I think that's one of but, the been one of the challenges with superhero games all along, right, is that they're so powerful, but it's not necessarily going to be fun. I think it's more of a Superman problem that, yeah, than, Superman uh, problem. yeah, but I, I still think I, there's a lot of people who are just like, you can't make a good Superman game. I disagree. There have been, there have been decent Superman games that people don't even know about. Uh, but that's a whole other topic. I am I, I, like, like, think of the name. One of these days I'm going to, I'm actually friends with the guy who runs DC games and, uh, and he makes me wonder those they're like, there's a certain Marvel characters and like this just will never work as a game. <laughs> um, I mean, you make concessions like again, like the Hulk, like if you make a Hulk game, he's just going to smash anything. Realistically, quote unquote, <laughs> it'll just smash anything in one punch. Right. And he's and like it's in the canon. Uh, it's very confusing, but like the angrier he gets, the stronger he gets. Uh, so like theoretically, like he shouldn't really have a health bar. Uh, you know, <laughs> uh, there's all these caveats, uh, but, you know, at the same time, you know, you, you try to be in line with with brand stuff like uh, I remember Juggernaut. So Juggernaut was uh, an issue that would come up, came up in a couple games, uh, you know, and, and before that, before like Marvel really like looked at this stuff, it really was just a health bar thing with Juggernaut. And then you go back and play the X-Men arcade game. Juggernaut has a has a bazooka for some reason in the <laughs> X-Men arcade game. And, you know, you just basically punch him till his health goes down. Um, but that's not what Juggernaut is. Juggernaut is nothing can stop the Juggernaut. So if he gets moving, you can't stop him. Like that's, that's it. That's, that's his power. Uh, so punching something that can't be stopped isn't really on brand. So uh, we actually had an incident in uh, Spider-Man Shattered Dimensions. Uh, where if you play that game, it's like loosely based on a classic Spider-Man comic where uh, he fights Juggernaut. And, you know, th there is a, a fair amount of uh, just 
try, trying to punch him and stuff and, and, and stuff isn't really working out. But, um, but then you, you realize that it, it actually is kind of hurting him a little bit and, and you get this message. Well, actually I should back up. That was an issue. That was an issue like that I brought up. Actually, my intern brought it up before I did. Um, and he was like, yeah, you know, the juggernaut can't be stopped, but, but your bird's punching him and, and he's, he's getting hurt. And it's like, and it was like, yeah, you're, you're right. That shouldn't be the case. And so I brought it up with Activision and they were like, yeah, you know, I understand, but it's just so far along now. We can't really change the whole design based on that. And, and, uh, and I was like, okay, well, here's something we can do. So the uh, fiction behind this particular game is that this mystical tablet has splintered into all these different sh- Spider-Man dimensions. Side note, this birthed the Spider-Verse, by the way, this game. It's where the whole root of it. Um, <clears throat> and uh, yeah, so Spider-Man Shattered Dimensions, and um, he... Uh, so yeah, this magical tablet has been split across these universes, and in most cases, it's giving these super villains extra powers that they don't already have like uh deadpool in the ultimate universe can split himself into other deadpools and stuff like that but the uh crimson gem of sidorak is what gives the juggernaut his power and it's got kind of an attitude on its own so the idea was that let's just say that the crimson gem of sidorak is basically fighting with the power of this tablet and it's like instead of enhancing his powers, it's weakening him. Hmm. So that was the basic idea that, that I came up with. And, and it was like, okay, th- these, we've got some VO sessions like tomorrow. <laughs> uh, let's throw in a line about this. And so now if you don't play the game, you'll hear Madam Web uh, talk to Spider-Man with her Madam Web powers. Like, uh, you know, the, the, the power of the, the gem of Sidorak is being sedated by the power of this uh, artifact. Uh, so that's all we needed. We have an explanation. So now Spider-Man can proceed to beat the crap out of the Juggernaut. And and there's a, a lore reason for it. Yeah, that's cool. So yeah, stuff like that would come up. Must have been the hero. <laughs> you know, I honestly, like, I don't know how many people playing the game would have stopped to think, hmm, I should not be... I should not be able to defeat the juggernaut like this, but yeah, there would be people. Oh, uh, there absolutely would be. But, you know, I think at a, like a, almost a subconscious level, when you have people looking for little things like that, like people don't really even register that it's making the game better mm-hmm. and, and more, more like, uh, you know, what they expect it to be. So, so yeah, that's that's kind of I, I like to make the comparison that like the best CGI you don't even know is there, right? Because because so it's it's just it's just uh, you know touching up something, um, and and yeah, for all you know, it's it was shot that way. So like that's kind of how I saw my job was like just making the little things right will make the overall product better, at least at a brand level. I like that, but hey, we can't. Uh in the thing <laughs> we can't end okay it without getting into your operencia and yeah a uh, circus electric i mean this i've been playing this it's kind of this dungeon crawler a lot of story based a lot of uh, mm-hmm. a lot of narrative characters and it's actually fairly crunchy in terms of rpg mechanics so you had to uh let me just kind of talk about this game a little bit sure yeah uh operencia is a lot of the fans of this channel will definitely want to check this game out by the way cool cool yeah um you know, I had a relationship with uh, Zen Studios dating back to my Marvel days because they did the Marvel pinball tables. And I was like the the contact for, for the Marvel pinball tables. And so I had a really good relationship with uh, Zen. And a few years after I'd left Marvel, I, um, I you know, I was looking for work. And uh, I actually started out uh, just freelancing uh, with Zen, just doing PR even. And then uh, they were like, you know, we've got this RPG we're working on and, you know, we we like like the story we've kind of laid out. um, But, you know, it really needs like just a good writer to come in and and tie everything together. Uh, Do do you want to do that? (laughs) And I was like, yes, please sign me up. I mean, 
it showed me what the game was like and you know it's inspired by like wizardry back in the day that's a little a, wizardry, maybe a little legend of grimrock um or, yeah uh, there's that that's a comparison that's made somebody too was, but somebody was comparing it to bard's tell four but not sure how the that was a contemporary game that came out yeah, around the same like time contemporary right for that to be yeah i mean the bard's tale one was definitely one of the influences uh eye of the beholder was another influence oh, yeah. and and like really old school final fantasy was also an influence um so uh so yeah i was like yeah this is totally the kind of game that i'm interested in uh so so yeah they're like yeah so it's based on hungarian folklore uh so i had to brush up on my hungarian folklore which i uh was, was not really familiar with not an expert by any means so that was a lot of fun research to do, actually. Like they have a lot of like similar fairy tales that are just a little bit different. Um, like and uh, and and just uh, a lot of like a lot of stories that are frankly not very good. A lot of <laughs> a lot of uh, stories that are just like really dark, like really dark. Um, like and so I, I basically like took all these stories. Oh, there a lot of stories too, where it's like the the knight and the like. Nobody has a name, right? It's just like the the brave knight goes on this adventure. Uh, so I had to like I, my my thought was like, okay, let's take all these stories, every story I can possibly do anything with that that uh, you know fits within our our game, and just make a world out of it. Like that's like I did at Marvel, you know, like <laughs> that's the, the lore is already there. I just need to, well, that this, the lore is already there. I just need to put it together. Uh, I like to make the comparison to fables, the comic book fables, or even Shrek, you know, like Shrek is like a, a world of, of, uh, of our own fairy tales. We know very well. This is a world of fairy tales. You don't probably know very well, unless you're Hungarian or, or out in central and Eastern Europe. Uh, so, um, so yeah, I, I created uh, kind of the angle was a world where uh, history meets legend. So we actually do have like, like Attila the Hun is in there as a character. Uh, uh, like That's some, bad. it's like a different pronunciation, right? <laughs> Attila, yeah, Attila is, is how they say it. Um, and so, but it's like a legendary version of these characters. So like, you know, you, you look at, Attila and it's like uh he's a terrible person to some people or he's like a great person to others right so in the legendary interpretation he is like this great warrior uh then there's like these other historical uh Hungarian figures that are in it there's actually like a a huge like kind of square area in in, in Budapest to go to and and these guys are there like on horseback and I was like, Oh yeah, that's the guy in the game. One make when I went there, I was like, Oh yeah, he's one of the skeletons I fight. <laughs> um, so yeah, it, it was cool to just kind of create this world where, uh, all these fairy tales came together. And, you know, I, I really, I was hoping it would be a bit bigger game than it was so we could do even more with it. Cause there's a lot of stuff we didn't touch. Like I would have liked to have talked about their version of the devil or, or dog or dog. I think it's pronounced or dog. O R D O G and it's got like two two dots over the, one of the O's. <laughs> uh, it means metal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I'm sure there's a band. There's got to be a metal band out there called the Old Dog. Uh, there, there's got to be. There's probably multiple of them. Um, but, but yeah, it, it was just a, a really positive experience. And and uh, so you know they they had like they had like these basic archetypes. Like they had a character named warrior and a character named uh thief and a character, you know, just obviously temporary. So I went in and, uh, and gave them, uh, you know, names. And in, in some cases, you know, there were actually the occasional rare Hungarian folktale that has a named character. So you get like a, a character named, uh, that there's a character named Maze. I don't know if you've met him yet, but he's a knight. And there, there's a, a famous folktale in Hungary about a, a, a knight named Maze, and he's like old in that. So we have like the young version of him. And at the same time, if there's a folktale that talks about the brave knight, just generic, hey, that's Maze. You know, like uh, I'll, I'll make that story one of his stories that's happened. 
Uh, so that was a, just like a fun puzzle to solve. Um, you know, it, it, it was, it was just a really fun project to work on and uh, everyone who played it seemed to really enjoy it, especially if you're into blobbers as I, I didn't know that term going in, but wow. blobbers. I never know when they call it that <laughs> because you're a blob, you're a blob of people in a square. That's it. I, I think that's the reason it's called a, a oh, blobber. I, it, yeah, I thought it was, it's, it's, it's nice to get around in because you got the map there where you can it's the grid based mm -hmm. movement so you know where you are that's one of the problems i have with <laughs> some of these games is you get oh i don't know where i am i guess yeah so this, this uh it's hard to navigate yeah i think there is a mode if you want to do it like old school wizardry style and no. whip out the graph paper <laughs> you can do that but uh yeah the default is not that it's a very pretty map uh i take it you're in the you're probably in the castle that, that has like the water on the ceilings did you make yeah. it that far okay cool cool Thank you. yeah i I, I really like the look of the game, even after all these years now. Came out. They really got their money's worth out of you too, because a lot of the a lot of the reviews I read, they specifically pointed out, you know, it's the story, it's the characters, the campfire scenes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was uh, very flattering because you know I, I had contributed to the writing to a lot of Marvel games. I'd never written a, a game. Uh, this is the, the game awesome. first game that I actually just purely wrote myself. Oh. Um, you know, but not just me. There were uh, there are other people on the team, but you know, it was 95% me. <laughs> um, yeah. And, and, you know, I wanted to make it just fun and, you know, Princess Bride is an inspiration there a little bit too. Uh, and uh, yeah, yeah. That's the, the whole inspiration. <laughs> what's that? That's, that's always a good inspiration. Yeah. 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 You know, I, I wanted it to be a serious tale that didn't take itself too seriously, which I think, I think is what most people liked about it. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we got Circus Electric. Yes, that's the oh, last awesome. game. Last game published there. I did work on some titles that will ne unfortunately never see the light of day, but uh, that's the last game that was uh, that fully done uh, there. And Circus Electric, yeah, it's like a, it's like a, a it takes place in London, eighteen ninety nine, in like a steampunk kind of setting. And you know, I thought it would be interesting as a writer to be like, okay. It's a steampunk world. Why is it a steampunk world? You know, like, is it or like, what, did something happen that didn't happen in our actual timeline that, uh, you know, set the world on this path instead of, you know, actual non steampunk <laughs> with, with just, you know, steam elements. We've always had steam, but, you know, we're not a steampunk society. Right. Uh, so so I figured out, yeah, yeah. OK, um, this event in 1873 happened and it set the world on a different path. Uh, and then I had to figure out, okay, why did this happen? Uh, and the, the answer to that is at the end of the game. Uh, I don't want to spoil it for you. It's, it's very weird. I didn't think the team would go for it. I wasn't even totally sold myself on the idea. Uh, but it, it kind of, it, it seems like people liked it. <laughs> it's, it's an interesting twist near the end as to why uh, everything turned out this way. Um, and yeah, then we just, it's got um, it's kind of like a darkest dungeon type game. So you're going to you're going to get circus performers instead of your typical like knights and, and mages and such. Uh, and they all have their own unique abilities uh, to help uh, to help save London from this event called the maddening that is turning uh, just normal people into like uh, mindless killers, basically. Uh, so, so yeah, we, we, the way we tell our story, you know, we, we wanted to do like a darkest dungeon type game, but we also wanted to have like a, a bigger narrative focus with, you know, characters that, you know, there are certainly a lot of disposable characters that you play as, but we want to have characters like on the periphery that you cared about and had their own story. Um, and so those are the, that's where the story comes from. And, you know, the, the characters you fight as have their own. Uh, what we call barks in the industry, uh, battle cries, you know, there's just fun things that they say uh, when they're going to slap you or whatever. Uh, but yeah, like it was fun to to just create this kind of alternate 1899 where things are a little bit different, where, you know, Edison and, and Tesla are like really good friends just because, you know, it kind of fits the the event of what happened in, in 1873 a little bit better than like their traditional rivalry uh you know like uh uh just you know there's zeppelins and stuff it's typical steampunk uh 
the circus focus. I mean, that, I mean, who's not kind of intrigued by the circus? You know, there's all that. All those yeah, it, it 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 felt like X Men a little to me. Like uh, you know, like the X Men have their own mutant powers. Like every circus character has like some kind of mutant power, basically. That's a lot of fun setting up the circus shows. Yeah, yeah, it's a little puzzle uh, on its own. Oh, and these uh, newspapers. That was a good touch, too. Yeah, I mean, we... It's a good spot to tell stories. Yeah, absolutely. It's, like, completely optional, but if you want to get into the lore of it all, uh, you know, I wrote 30 or so newspaper articles um, that just tell you what's going on. They'll They'll go more into the what's happening in the world at that time, or they might just, you know, talk about uh you know the edison thing i mentioned <laughs> like Tom, thomas edison like declares uh eli edwards eli edwards is sort of like an elon musk of of the late 1800s i guess you could say uh and you know edison there's an article i wrote about edison calling him out as being a fraud and there's something wrong about him or you know and, and there is he's right spoiler alert <laughs> that's a fun game Cool. Yeah, it was a lot of I, I I didn't really I hadn't really played a RPG quite like that before. I I didn't play Darkest Dungeon when it came out, uh, but I really I really got into it. Like when I would start getting the builds that were you know a little past alpha, uh, you know it, it was like oh yeah this is a lot of fun and it, it's cool. I think I think our story is is decently paced enough so that it's not annoying people. But you know when you need a to take a break from the the fighting action, there's something more for you there. That's really too bad that they're not going to do those anymore. Sounds like they've decided to focus on pinball. Excuse. For now, for now, we'll, we'll see. <laughs> I have hopes that they'll, uh, you know, they're just kind of weathering a storm here. Yeah, they just, just they just came out with. Uh, oh, sorry, go ahead. I mean, it was fun playing Operencia and then Circus because you could see a lot yeah. of the similar thoughts. You know, you could feel sort of a. A good yeah, definitely a lot of the same people on uh, both projects there. You know, innovative. I mean, they're innovating on this, these formulas. And... Oh, yeah, totally. It's, uh, yeah, we we wanted to do the things that we like, but we want to do our own version of the things we like. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's good stuff. Well, geez, uh, Chris, we're up, uh, kind of getting up against our time here. I'm okay, gonna... well, I'm I'm happy to chat as long as you want. Uh, or oh, there are other things we now have... if you want. <laughs> it's been we fun chatting. Podcast pinball but you did some of the pinball obviously uh well yeah well, well at zen i basically for pinball i basically just read over scripts and you know i didn't really do much writing or anything on the pinball there i did more pinball stuff at marvel actually because uh i i was more uh into the production of the pinball tables at marvel than i was actually at zen which i may sound a little backwards but it's kind of the way it was um, yeah, I, I did a lot. Uh, I did a lot of like including actual lines from comic books because uh, I thought, you know, that'd be a, a fun way. Like, there's a whole uh, like Dark Phoenix saga. Like if you play the Dark Phoenix saga part of the X-Men table, it's like word for word out of the comics. Um, Which, you know, I, I, I don't think that's actually been done that faithfully <laughs> we did a civil war table had a lot of like just comic book stuff in it that was written word you know just word for word what like you know steve rogers and and tony stark arguing back and forth like they did in the comics like just while you play they'll say this kind of uh you know conversation they had and just a, a random captain america issue during the civil war you don't have the right thing here let me see if I can share this. Uh, oh, heck, my YouTube's gone berserk. <laughs> I think that's it, right? Uh, that's the, the X-Men table, yeah. Okay. Yeah, we I did like I think 17 or 18 Marvel tables when I was there, and there's been a few more since. Wow, that looks like that was fun. Oh, yeah, it was a fun project to work on because, you know, they, they weren't like always super intense. They're, they're pinball tables, but you could also, you know, p people would be like, like, how do you actually add like a story to pinball? And, and you can, you know, you'd like have certain missions that you have to do or like just a certain sequence of ramps and you'll say different things that actually tell a little story on their own. 
Oh, that is really neat. Oh, the tables are great. Uh, all their all their stuff is great. They uh, they just came out with what they're calling Pinball M, which is an M rated uh, pinball. So they they have like uh, I think Duke Nukem's in there, and there's a Chucky table and a couple other uh, horror. Why Dead by Daylight? I think is another one. Like just you know st- stuff uh, that you can't do in a teen rated game, like uh, the the core Pinball FX. It's it's called this. It's been a while since I really thought about pinball. Of course, I played a lot of pinball. <laughs> you know, one of the things I noticed, I was disappointed. One of the maybe the only thing I was disappointed with my the book I'm using in my, my video games course because they talked about the history of video games and they they mm-hmm. just gloss over the whole pinball era. Oh yeah, I mean that's such a pivotal thing that you had the pinball and the, all these electromechanical things in arcades way before, well before the right. Movie. It's like I took a I took a history of rock course uh, in my senior year of college and and it was pretty good for the most part but like they got to heavy metal and they didn't mention Guns and Roses. What the hell? How do you not mention Guns and like not even mention it? <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I mean, I guess you can't cover everything. I get that, but like I, I would feel like you should at least yeah. But there's this thing called pinball. <laughs> right, right. All this yeah, pinball is absolutely pinball. influential on on video games. Uh, yeah, it's uh, and I think video game pinball is super underrated. And those who those who play it like really get into it, like the fighting game community gets into fighting games. You know, like it's oh, it's pretty cool. And you can do things in video pinball that you can't do in real pinball. Uh, you know, having characters jump around the screen and everything, and just uh, it, it. And that's what that's what I've always liked about the Zen tables is like they they really. They really capture that. And re- in the last few years, they've actually been doing real tables, too. And they'll take the real tables, like the Williams tables, and they'll they ha- they'll have like a mode where you can play like with enhanced uh, 3D character models that'll walk around the screen and stuff. It's uh, it's pretty cool. That is a lot of fun. Yeah. I think there's some of the virtual reality stuff, too, right? And that, I see mm-hmm. that. Yeah, there's Star Wars VR. Uh, Star Wars Pinball VR. There's also uh, just uh, Pinball FX VR. Uh, it doesn't have as many tables, but um, you know, they're they're it's a great pinball's great for VR. It really is. Yeah, we. I remember playing on my Amiga computer back in the day. Even before that, there was on the Commodore sixty four. There was like a midnight pinball game or something like that. Oh sure, yeah. I mean, uh, a lot of people loved three uh, D Space Cadet. I think it was called on Windows ninety five. <laughs> like it, there was a pinball game that came default with Windows ninety five. Uh, 98, I think too. And a, a lot of, I think it's called 3D Space Cadet. A lot of people love that game. I mean, we got so much more advanced physics and video games too that would make for. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Pinball yeah. games. Well, if you got time for a few more questions, I have some here from. Sure, Jeff. sure. You want me to run these? I'll just run these down here. Yeah. Yeah. Who gave you the nickname Seabake? <laughs> uh, actually, a college roommate of mine named uh, Bo Howard. Uh, he just like looked at me one day and went, Hey, sea bake. I was like, what? <laughs> sea bake. And and it like totally stuck. Uh, and yeah, through my career and stuff too. So yeah, it's, it's uh, just oh. been my nickname since I was like 21, 22, somewhere around there. <laughs> I think we've already answered this one. He's asking, did, re- re- did reading video game magazines as a kid make you want to get into gaming journalism? I think we could say. I that. would say no, actually, oh. because, uh, because, Honestly, when I read that stuff as a kid, I didn't think of it in terms of like human beings are behind this making this. It, it just like it just appeared and it was words that I read. It wasn't like the idea that people are making this and that this is something that I could do. That never popped in my head when I was just mm. reading Nintendo Power or whatever. Uh, so, you know, if it had, I, I probably would have thought considered it an aspiration. But no, it, it wasn't really until so that opportunity fell in my lap that I really even thought about like writing about video games. Grateful day. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it really was. This is a pretty good one. I think uh, was it challenging doing PR for Lucas arts when you were juggling both in-house and third party published titles? Um, I mean, every project has its own unique challenges. Uh, you know, I was usually pretty focused on one title at a time. 
Uh, I did like contribute to Star Wars Galaxies a little bit, but it wasn't really my responsibility. Uh, so, so I was pretty focused on Episode Three, and then I was focused on Battlefront Two, and then I was focused on Lego Star Wars Two, and then I was focused on Empire at War, and then I was focused on The Force Unleashed. Um, or there was also like a PSP Battlefront game in there somewhere too. But it, well, you know, there were other there's stuff like Thrillville was a game that we had too uh, that that I was also on but it was mainly a lot of times i was just helping out with this stuff um but yeah you know there was always like some unique political situation between wherever you are there's always like political situations between different entities so like uh oh, yeah. you know, there, there was something i never really understood between the lucas arts and, and the collective who made the episode three game there was some bad blood there i never really understood uh there was like uh you know the the lego developers want to do their own thing and then you know lucas arts people need to make it so that it's the same thing we want to do with star wars and stuff like that uh you know there's there's probably something between pandemic and lucas arts i wasn't aware of i don't know uh it, 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 there's always unique challenges but it's, it's more at the development level usually i mean there's probably there's sometimes like uh you know promotional marketing PR stuff that comes up, but I didn't really have any issues per se. I can recall. There's always personalities. And... <laughs> sure, sure. Yeah, you want to make sure. Ego. You know, here's a big secret of PR. Most of the quotes you read in press releases are not actually stated by the person saying them. What? The PR person. <laughs> <laughs> what? Not always. Not always. Oh. There were certain people like uh, one of my favorite quotes in one of the press releases I wrote was uh, by Peter Hirschman, who now runs uh, development on an FPS with Respawn for Star Wars. Like right now, that's what he's doing. And uh, like the the announcement was that LucasArts was working with Free Radical. Do you know what game was would have come of that? Are you, do you personally know? Mm. It would have been Battlefront 3. Okay. But that was never officially announced. But the, the collaboration was announced. And one of the things, you know, I, I talked to Peter about like what his quote should be. I think I probably threw him a draft of something. And he was like, no, I, I want to do my own thing, and which is great. I love that. And, and he was like, uh, let's have some fun with it. Let's let's be like in the this is in the book, too, if you, if you want to look it up uh, in the battle of uh, great game collaborations. These guys are at the front of the line or something like that. And so he had he had battle in this quote and he had front in his quote, like separated by a few words a little more eloquent than what I just said. And uh, nobody caught it. Like, no, like people reported on the, the uh, collaboration all over, but no one actually in comments, the press itself, like nobody caught battle in front, like just a few, <laughs> few words apart. Oh. Um, and so uh, it's, it's my pleasure to present that little Easter egg for a game that never happened uh to the world <laughs> one of the many things you can learn in the book yeah i also have a chapter at the end that that people seem to respond really well to i just threw it at the end but it's just like some memories of working at lucas arts like the time uh you put back up here like the time uh people love to hear the story of the time when i was just at my cube we had the high cube wall so you couldn't actually see over them and uh, I hear a voice, a very familiar voice on the other side of my cube say, uh, you know, I, I, I think you would like Star Wars Empire at War. It's like chess in space. It was George Lucas talking to Francis Ford Coppola, showing him around the office. Oh, wow. That's yeah. Yeah. Almost like that. Yeah. yeah. There was another time he showed uh, Peter Jackson around. Just I didn't see him that often, but when I did, it was really awesome. You think somebody would have come around and been like, hey, guess who's coming here? You know? <laughs> but just, whoa, just look over your shoulder and there they are. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah, this stuff is just great. Yeah, it was a, a definitely a fun place to work, especially for a, a Star Wars fan around 30. You know, I don't think I ever said through the course of this interview, but um, I left LucasArts because 
a friend of mine I had at LucasArts uh, was like, hey, I need a, a right-hand man at Marvel, and uh, I want you to do it. And I wanted to get closer to actual game development uh, than PR that I was doing. So I was like, all right. I mean, I don't like Marvel quite as much, but I really like Marvel. I really like, I love Marvel. And, and then, you know, I get there late 2007, and then a few months later, Iron Man comes out. So it was like really awesome time to go to Marvel. <laughs> I went to the premieres of uh, every movie from Iron Man to uh, Winter Soldier, which was amazing. You know, as a kid, it's like Hollywood premieres. Whoa, (laughs) that's the coolest thing ever. I think that's about all I've got. Okay. So, yeah, thanks again. This has been really fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I. I really if appreciate any questions you. Come up uh, about Star Wars or Marvel. I'll know where to go. Oh, please do, please do. <laughs> well, yeah. I, well, I won't send you any trivia questions, though. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows how much of that stuff I've forgotten over the years? You've forgotten more than I've ever known. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks again. Good yeah. Time. Thank you so much, Matt. Good touch. All right. <laughs> And phew, that's all for this week's episode. Hope you guys enjoyed that. I uh, should be back very soon with some new stuff. Uh, you know, I'm kind of interesting to do another review retrospective. So if you got games you really want me to cover, uh, let me know what you think. Uh, we also have a lot of great interviews coming up. Uh, so stay tuned. Lots of great stuff here at the Matt Cave. As always, I want to thank you. Thank you. Thank you. With full grad- gratitudinous thanks. Thank you for... <laughs> Uh, supporting this show, keeping Matt Chat on the air, would not, could not do this show without you and your amazing Retron support. So, if you're thinking, hmm, <laughs> I like Matt, I like the channel, I like the stuff he covers, I like uh, hearing from cool people like Chris, but for, uh, do I want to go to that Patreon link in the show notes? And the answer to that is, yeah you do because it's really cool and you'll be on discord with some really cool people uh the, the kind that have all these news segments that i keep talking about uh, you're really missing out uh, it only takes a couple of minutes and a couple of bucks and you're good to go as a full-fledged restaurant and that's what you want to be folks uh, so please do that if you already have thanks once again and uh let's see what all we have here okay <laughs> first up <laughs> see if i can get the order right this time what about that news from the Mac Cave? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I know. You've probably been looking at my awesome new fanny pack. You know, I could have put my, uh, you know, I could put my phone in there like that and just, you know, whip it out. Oh, yeah, man. It just feels right. I don't know. How did I survive without one of these, man? I don't know if I can get a little closer. <laughs> uh, uh, anyway, um, I got bigger news than the fanny pack. Or do I? <laughs> Miko, good old Miko. Yeah, Miko's got something for us. The Black Parade, an unofficial expansion for Thief Gold. Well, now, there's a game I don't think I've covered before, Thief Gold. I know a lot of people, that's their favorite game of all time. Uh, let's see, by Fuyad Industries, and yes, I looked it up. It is <laughs> Fuyad, <laughs> or somewhere in that vicinity, folks. I think it's probably a French word. It's got about 17 vowels, you know, very Frenchy. Uh, let's see, 10 huge, open-ended, and meticulously crafted missions with varied themes packed with content. A brand new protagonist thrown into a dark, intricately woven story of crime and conspiracies. 28 voiced characters, totaling roughly 1,800 new lines of dialogue and much, much more. That sounds like a a hell of an unofficial expansion, so definitely check that out uh, if you are a fan of Thief Gold. And if you don't know what that is, check out Thief Gold. (laughs) There you go. All right, Tired Gaming Dad. Oh, what's old Tired Gaming Dad uh, up to? He's excited about Unforetold Witchstone. This will release into Steam Early Access on January 25th, 2024. Experience the living, reactive lands of Kalsundia through unprecedented options to roleplay, influence others, and set your own goals. 
Each journey feeds into a non-linear narrative system that changes relationships, <laughs> relationships <laughs> and outcomes dynamically. Gone are the days of laborious quest chains as you enter into a freer world of milestones and opportunities where you choose who to help, what to do, and what you aim to achieve. Yes, this is the new corporate vision. Uh, let's see, back by classic, oh, here we go. Uh, classic turn-based combat and stealth systems and steeped in the universe from the mind of Ed Greenwood. Okay, I got my attention. They probably should have led with that. <laughs> Ed, Gre Ed Greenwood, hell yeah. Uh, creator of the Forgotten Realms. Uh, you are invited to shape the fate of the world. And that's from Spearhead Games. Uh, so let me uh, go back to the title of this thing. <laughs> Unforetold Witch Dome. Uh, so thank you to Miko and Tire Gaming Dad. And last but not least, Matt Bradley Shurgy, my co-pilot on the <laughs> chat. Uh, he's also got a news item. Wizardum. Wizardum. Wizardoom. Wizardoom. One of those. Uh, from Imperheart Games. It's also in early access. The ancient seal of Terra Bruma has shattered. You know, am I the only person that likes that Rolling Stone song, Shattered? You know, shattered, shattered. I mean, you know, I always uh, sing that whenever we <laughs> playing D and D, and somebody casts that Shatter spell, and everybody always just looks at me like, "What the hell are you talking about?" I'm like, "It's the Rolling Stones, Shattered." You know? Okay. Anyway. Uh, where am I at? Uh, unleashing the forces of chaos once more. As one of the last mages of Wizardum Sanctuary, he must embark on a quest to find the source of this corruption and push the chaos back before they consume the kingdom in a speedrun friendly fantasy FPS, <laughs> tearing a page from the spellbooks of the Ninesy, uh, Ninesy? Man, I cannot read today. Although Ninesy, that sounds like something. That's the, the seed of something cool. <laughs> 90s fantasy FPS classics like Hexen and Heretic. Uh, one of the reviews, and this is from a Dark Blue Monkey, and that's their username. <laughs> and I, I like their uh, sum summary, and they say, this is a phenomenal. It's like Wolfenstein and Catacomb 3D, or Eye of the Beholder, or Heretic, had a baby. <laughs> Interesting. All right, well, I think that'll do it for the news. What about the ale of the week? Oh, the ale of the week. Where's the ale? <laughs> it's kind of camouflaged over there, man. I don't know. If <laughs> well, doesn't that look sinister? Sinister. Oh, you can't even make it out, can you? Uh, you know, my lighting's a little bit messed up because I wanted to zoom out so you could see this, this the fanny pack. But uh, <laughs> anyway, it's pretty creepy looking. Looks kind of menacing there on the shelf. Just a a skull with these blue eyes. <laughs> kind of scary. It's not normal. That's what it says on the can. Let's see, what's the name of this beer? Uh, zombie Ice. Zombie Ice. Not to be confused with butt ice. <laughs> Undead Double Pale Ale. It's three Floyds. It's a really cool font. It looks very sort of Iron Maiden y. You know, I don't know if you're going to be able to see any of this stuff, but really good design on that, on this can. Other than, other than the, the small fact that it's almost impossible to read the text on it, it's pretty cool. Let's see, three Floyds. Now, come on. Oh, boy. Let me see if I can make this up. Uh, crafted with an unholy amount of citra hops, this double undead pale ale heralds the zombie evolution after the dust has settled. From the apocalypse. Wow. <laughs> Brewed and canned by three Floyds out of Munster, Indiana. Huh. So you might be able to pick this up where you live. Oh boy, it looks like I see the alcohol. Is that a six or an eight? Uh, it's an eight. Alcohol, 8.5% by volume. So definitely on up there. You know, I've had stronger, but that's it's probably about twice, the, you know, that's, that's the double. You know, it's about twice the strength of a, you know, a typical beer. Uh, so anyway, let's get this thing open and see what it's all about. Yeah, let's pour a little bit here in the glass before we commit it to the horn. Just so we can, ooh, I can already smell the hops. Oh, they really are. Absolutely overpowering hops on that uh, citra hops. Yeah, I really like the citra hops. As you can tell from the name. 
Well, I don't know if that's what the intention behind the name of Citra is, but it always uh, smells citrusy to me. They're like a lemony zest, uh, coriander type of aroma on those. But we don't want to drink out of a glass like that when you've got a horn like this. I mean, come on. Let's pour the zombie into the horn. Ooh, yeah. That's probably sufficient. <laughs> Was 8.5 when we playing around with this thing. All right, as I, as I said already, the smell, you know, very citrusy, very obviously hoppy. You know, I think they said it had twice the uh, amount of uh, citrus hops they normally use. You definitely smell the hops. I mean, if you can't smell the hops in this, just hang it up. Here, you're not going to be reviewing beers. Uh, what else is in there? You know, sometimes I just, there, I smell something and I just cannot put my finger on it. I just I don't know what that smells like. Maybe kind of an orange, tangerine. You know, it's not quite right, but it's somewhere in that vicinity. Uh, but anyway, it smells really nice. Uh, you know, 8.5 alcohol. You might expect some fumes. <laughs> like, whoa. <laughs> Nothing like that. It smells really, really smooth. Uh, it just makes you want to drink it smelling it. So let's give it a taste here. Oh. Uh, that is really a uh, tasty kind of a a licorice well not licorice uh, uh, it's very sweet um what is that man this one is just really challenging my palate <laughs> uh, uh, it's sweet a little bit of bitter uh, maybe some kind of like a grapefruit uh, without the bitterness if you can imagine that <laughs> what that would taste like you know it's a uh, uh, it's again very curious uh, taste. Let me try it again. Huh. This is it's going to be challenging to describe this to you. It doesn't taste like there's a lot of alcohol in it, which is kind of nice. Um, it's uh, refreshing. It's actually really really smooth. Uh, it's more. You know, it's like the sweet, it's kind of hard to say, is it sweet, is it bitter, because they're, they're so perfectly balanced, it just kind of, it just kind of uh, resolves itself. I'm going to try this one more time, man. It's a... You know, I just really, I don't know what else I can tell you that this tastes like other than just really hoppy. Um, maybe I'll try some out of the glass. You know, sometimes these things are just so perfectly balanced in terms of ingredients you know it's not like a, a fruity or citrusy or some you know one elements really leaping out here yeah I really am again struggling to come up with the uh, words to describe the taste of this thing uh, it is very very good if you like hoppy flavors it's there it's not too bitter. It's not too sweet. There's really no cherry or apricot or any of those sort of usual flavors <laughs> uh, in this. And, you know, I'm going to try it one more time. Yeah, I just don't know what else to tell you. <laughs> kind of malty and uh, very uh, hoppy. That's about the best I can do on this. Uh, maybe a little bit of a... Uh, what is that? For some reason, I'm wanting to say licorice, but that's not quite the right uh, uh, flavor that I'm thinking of. Anyway, you might have to uh, track this one down <laughs> and tell me what you think. Maybe like a black uh, grape uh, kind of a flavor there. It's very subtle, but there's definitely some kind of unusual flavor profile on this one. Uh, anyway, I really, really like this, actually. You know, it's uh, I'm really kind of pleased, actually, you know, actually pleased that it's kind of hard to pin down exactly what this tastes like. It's kind of fun uh, for somebody who's been tasting so many beers. You know, you find one that's just really hard to uh, describe. I mean, it's kind of a, a fun. You know, it's an anomaly. Uh, but anyway, I'm going to go, uh, you know, I'm tempted to go a full five out of five drinking horns on this. I, I, you know, they, they just did such a good job with the, the packaging and the presentation and this, the flavor is great. You know, it's hard to describe this. You know, I think this is the kind of beer where, you know, if, you're, if you really like this, uh, you might have to keep getting it, you know, if you want this flavor, because I haven't tasted that 
uh, before uh, in other ales. I don't, I don't know if it's just the fact that it's so incredibly, uh, uh, you know, hoppy with the citra. Uh, but anyway, that's really, really good. I uh, said, so yeah, I think I would go, uh, yeah, let's go ahead and give it five out of five. I mean, <laughs> uh, I was kind of hesitant a little bit, but then I keep looking at this can and thinking, yeah, we'll, we'll bump it up a notch. Uh, so yeah, yeah, if you could find this, uh, uh, what is this, uh, Zombie Ice? I think you should really try this. You know, it would be a real challenge for you. <laughs> You know, maybe you could do a better job than I did of sort of picking out the flavor profile on that. But uh, anyway, certainly tasty. All right, let's wrap it up with a quote. And I was looking for quotes from George Lucas. He comes up in this uh, interview, of course. And I thought this one was kind of interesting. You know, he's got a lot of great quotes. Uh, but I think this one kind of hits close to home uh, for those of us into retro and vintage games. Uh, even though it's not about games, but you'll see what I mean goes something like this. I am very concerned about our national heritage, and I am very concerned that films that I watched when I was young and the films that I watched throughout my life are preserved so that my children can see them. So I think we can all relate to that in terms of our vintage games collections, as well as films, of course. Now, anyway, ponder on that, and I'll see you guys next time. my good faith to you. If you've heard me, this ledge will remain steady as a rock. And that thing coming at me won't be what I think it is. If it is, there's no hard feelings, of course. But I'd be very disappointed.